Good morning. Easter is just around the corner. I feel like it snuck up early this year. You don't usually get a March Easter, but this is one we're gonna celebrate for sure. I would I'd hope, just before we get into the message today, earmark next weekend. Make sure that you're here. It's a great opportunity to invite somebody with you. Uh, you might be wondering, hey, it's Easter. How do we invite more people? Because it seems pretty full today. But uh, I promise we will make a room. We have a lot of services that you can join us for, and I would encourage you to be here for Easter. But this week, I am wrapping up our series Picture Perfect Family. I'm wrapping up our series, Picture Perfect Family. We've talked a lot about families, about parenting, and this week we're gonna be talking about marriage some. It's hard to hit each of these buckets, but here's one thing that I've noticed. Hollywood figured out years ago that we're all intrigued by families. We're all intrigued by marriage and the dynamics that come with it, and we don't want always the picture perfect family. There's no drama there. There's no intrigue. There's no humor there. We're kind of into those quirky, dysfunctional families. You go all the way back to Brady Bunch, I Love Lucy, and then, I mean, so many in between to one of my all-time favorites. Anyone remember Home Improvement? Anyone remember that one? Yes, somebody just made the noise, and I'm really grateful for that. But uh, Tim, the tool man, Taylor in Home Improvement. Man, it was so fun to watch the dysfunction unfold. We love it, we laugh at it, because it's things that we can't do in our day-to-day life. They're filmed before a live studio audience, or they have a laugh track behind it, so anytime there's tension, Anytime there's a a quick word that was out of place or maybe hurtful, people just laugh, and so we laugh along with it, but that's not how it works in my house. See, Tim, the tool man, Taylor, he could be trying to fix his dishwasher and try and make it work and then take a towel off his shoulder. He said, I couldn't get it to work, but sweetheart, you can make it work. You can be the dishwasher. And everyone laughs. Nobody laughs in my house (laughs) when I say that. My wife is not gonna laugh. No, she will use that as a weapon. She will come at me. And so it's fun on TV shows to see him play out. And that was not funny. It's not quirky. And the reason that we love it isn't because it's perfect, but because it's honest. And I think for many of us, we want an honest assessment of marriage. So as I forge into today, it's gonna feel like one of those weeks over the past few weeks, each one of these topics really could be its own series of talks. I mean, we could spend weeks talking about family, we could spend weeks talking about parenting, we probably will in the future, and it comes to marriage, same thing. And so today, I wanna really talk about a mindset that we can have when it comes to marriage. Because ultimately, I know this, Each and every one of us is in a different season when it comes to marriage. For some of you, it's something you're looking forward to. Maybe you're dating somebody and you're hoping to be engaged and you squeeze their hand a little extra hard right now. Like, come on, quit being lazy, get that ring, here we go. For some of you, you're in the middle of it and you're trying to navigate it. And being in marriage, wow, that can mean a lot. I mean, for some of you, it feels like your marriage is an eight out of 10 and you're just hoping maybe by today we can make it a nine. Wouldn't that be great? And the sun will come out and birds will chirp and it'll be awesome. For some of you, it's not going well. For some of you, it's challenging. For some of you, you fought last night. It carried into this morning. You didn't talk on the drive-in. You're frustrated. You put a smile on and waved to the Parkers. You got your coffee and you were cordial. You dropped the kids off. But even today, it feels cold in here. It feels hard. It feels challenging. I hope that God begins to work in some of that and we'd be open and receptive to what you want to speak. I'm not naive. Some of you also may be saying, hey, marriage is something I did, but that didn't end well. That, hey, I'm on my first or second or third marriage. I'm somewhere in between it and it, it, it didn't go as well. Well, I believe God can speak life into those relationships too. I believe regardless of where we're at when it comes to marriage, that God will speak into it. But marriage in itself is a pretty daunting proposition. We've all heard the stat, 50% of marriages don't make it, right? Like hovers right around 50% of marriages don't make it. And for something that is so central to what we do, Something that is so central to our life, the most important relationship that we have, for a lot of us, the most important commitment we ever make, 50% is not great odds. Think about it. What other thing in your life do you, are you so okay with 50%? Who gets on a plane and has the captain come over the thing all muffled and says, you know, guys, we got a 50% chance of getting there today. Let's just hope, you know, let's just, let's believe the best and see what happens. No way. I mean, Boeing is in rough shape, but 50%, it's not that bad, okay? Not that bad. Boeing employees, I'm sorry, but I, I get it can feel 
daunting. And so you start to ask the question, is a, is a great marriage even possible? Is a great marriage just reserved for those that we see on magazines or have it all together or have way more enough money and have done enough therapy and they're just have it all together and have the perfect family background and have all the great habits? Like, is that all it's for? But I remember seeing an interview uh, with the wife of Billy Graham. The Billy Graham was one of the most famous communicators of the Christian message in history. I mean, he led tens of thousands, if not more, people to Jesus and a relationship with him. Absolutely amazing. Someone you'd say, he's kind of the ideal. And Ruth Graham was his wife. It's sweet, sweet gal. And I remember towards the end of her life, someone was interviewing her and said, hey, come on, can we just be honest? You guys seem like you had it all together on the outside, but was divorce ever an option? Did you guys ever get angry with each other? And she stopped for a second. She said, you know, divorce was never an option. No, divorce was never an option. But murder, murder <laughs> was an option. And I thought, how great is that? I have a hope if Billy Graham couldn't pull it together as a husband, then maybe, maybe for all of us, we can approach this with a little bit of different tack. And uh, the temptation when I talk about marriage is always to get really granular. I love talking about topics, whether communication or conflict or sex or all those fun things. They're all really fun to talk about, but it, you can't really dial into one week. So I want to take a step back and talk about a mindset shift that we can have. Because if we look at what the Bible sets up marriage to be, it really is set up to be this illustration and demonstration of the way that God loves us. It's supposed to be running parallel as a practical example of the tangible love that God gives us. He sets up the example of marriage. In fact, in the Old Testament, before Jesus comes onto the scene, in this book of Hosea, which I feel like I get bonus points for preaching on Hosea, but, but God gives us this example of how his love for us is really similar as an illustration to the way that we have marriage today. It says this, I will make you my wife, talking to each and every of us, forever, showing you righteousness and justice and unfailing love and compassion, all these great things. I will be faithful to you and make you mine. And you will finally know me on a deeper level than just some God far away that we pray to on a cloud surrounded by angels. But you'll know me as this Lord figure, as something personal and familial. He uses these really intimate terms to say, you will know me like a husband knows a wife. That's how my love will come across to you. That my love will be characterized by grace, compassion, hope, joy, peace. The same things that I hope your marriages are known for. It's interesting, uh, as we look at this mindset, mindset shift that we can have when it comes to marriage, I came across a recent study from the University of Virginia. They had this thing called the National Marriage Project. It was this multi-year study studying couples all around the country to figure out what were the variables that makes a couple happy and healthy. What well, keeps a marriage healthy and strong? And one of the largest indicators that they found is something called the generosity scale. If you scored high on the generosity scale, usually there was a higher amount of health in your marriage. Now, typically, when we bring up generosity in church, it's financial. We bring up financial generosity. We do it a lot. There's a lot of biblical precedents for it. Good news today. Everyone relax. I'm talking about a different version of generosity today, okay? Not a money talk today. But how do we figure out generosity when it comes to our marriage? It means being generous in our time, attention, affection, words, all these things that we've talked about before and that we really know, but it's hard to play out. In this study, they defined generosity, and they might have stumbled into a biblical definition. The virtue of giving good things to your spouse freely and abundantly. Generosity is the virtue of giving good things to your spouse freely and abundantly. And to be honest, isn't that the kind of marriage that you wanna be a part of? Isn't that the kind of marriage that you wanna be in is somebody who, who is just freely and abundantly looking out for your best interests? That's the type of marriage that I wanna be a part of. And empirically and biblically, that's the type of marriage that we're called to. Because again, if we're gonna model it after God's love for us, we see tons of generosity in scripture. I'll use the most famous Bible verse out there, John three sixteen. It's a translation you may not be as familiar with. For this is how God loved the world. If this is how he's gonna do it, this is what he's gonna do. He had one strategy to love the world, what did he do? He gave. 
He gave. The first thing that he did, I want you to know my love for you. I'm gonna give my one and only son so that everyone who believes in him will not perish but have eternal life. God gave. His generosity was the first indicator of his love for us. We also see in Mark 10, 45, we see um, this other verse. For even the son of man came not to be served but to serve others and to give. Give his life as ransom for many. If we're talking about Jesus' mission statement on earth was to not to be served. The mission statement for your marriage is not to be served by somebody, but it's to give. Give your life as a ransom always and forever. And it's really easy to say. It's really fun. And it's great to be able to get up here and say, we should all have a generous marriage. But practically, how do we actually do that? Because it's challenging. It's great in theory, but it's really challenging to do. If we're here and we want a healthier marriage, which again, could mean you're taking your marriage from a seven to an eight, or you're taking your marriage from a one to a three, I believe that we're gonna start with generosity. So I have five ways that I wanna finish this one sentence. I wanna, I'm gonna finish this one sentence five ways to hopefully make it really practical. A generous marriage blank. A generous marriage is what? How do we categorize it? Let's finish it. A few different ways, I think we can glean a little bit of what God would have for marriage and how we can get a little bit better at it. Here he says, a generous marriage, what? Gives without expectation. A generous marriage gives without expectation. Remember their definition started with freely. And we like this in theory, but isn't it true that when we give with expectation, really we're just loaning? When we give with expectation and hopes that someone would give me dividends and interest in return, we're loaning you something. And with interest rates the way they are, It's challenging to live up to a loan at this point. You didn't realize it when you got into marriage, but have you accidentally become a loan shark to your spouse? Have you accidentally started to commoditize your affection, give it to them, and hoping that only I'll get some in response? That my expectation is I'll give it to you, but I need a little bit of interest on top. I'll I'll let you have a night away from the kids if you give me one night away and a brunch with the ladies. Like, that's like, you just tell me what it's gonna look like, and we start to negotiate and move back and forth, but this... Negotiation and expectation is never what God intended when it came to our relationships and marriage. Here's what we see in Romans. This is God's love towards us. But God showed his great love for us by sending Christ to die while we were still sinners. While there was no expectation for recourse. That Listen to me, listen to me. There are people in your neighborhood, in your friends, at your school, at your workplace, who have nothing to do with Jesus, but he gave his life freely for them not because they've done anything, not because they care. For each and every one of us, before we had any inclination or intuition of what God could mean or what we could do in response, God gave his life for us without expectation. So for for us, we see this beautiful model of what it could look like. But we naturally drift to either extreme. For some of you, you are very clear with your expectations. In fact, you are overly clear with your expectations. That you've become, and these are harsh words, so bear with me, you've become a little demanding, a little entitled as to what your spouse is gonna do for you. And when you do that, you leave no margin for them to be generous. All it is is an expectation. You leave no margin for them to show up for you in an unexpected way because you have been so over the top about what love looks like to you. On the other end, (laughs) there's people like me who you've created uh, unexpressed expectations. That these are, these are agreements that you've made with your spouse that you've never said out loud. These are agreements that you have with your spouse that have remained silent. These are hopes, dreams, and desires that they don't really know about, but I, you know, I kind of believe that when my wife is taking time to pray, really she's just praying, Heavenly Father, show me how to love my, my husband so well. Like, just give me clarity on all of his needs, hopes, dreams, and desires so I can fulfill them. But the reality is that God's not gonna tell my wife my expectations. My job is to tell my wife my expectations, hopes, dreams, and desires. That is my job to communicate those. Listen, the last thing you want, some of you might be here and guess what? I'm just gonna break the ice so you can have a conversation later. But the last thing you want is to be 10 or 15 years into marriage or more with all these unvoiced, unmet expectations, and you're sitting there bitter and resentful because they're not doing enough or not doing the right thing, they're tired, they're exhausted, and they feel defeated because they've tried and they've tried and they've tried and it never feels like enough. That they've guessed 
and they're wrong, that they've guessed. They were wrong again, and now they're just done guessing. And so for you, you feel tired, you feel exhausted because it's unmet, and for them, they feel tired and exhausted because they've tried and it's not working. So you create this distance between you. Well, what would it look like for one of you to go first and say, hey, you're just, I, I know I, I'm not always clear, but here's, here's what would be really important to me. Here's what would mean a lot to me. Here's what could really set me up to win. My wife actually did this the other day and I applauded her for it. She was very direct. Um, she has her own business and we have our personal family, so tax season's just around the corner. And she just looked at me out of nowhere. She said, hey, um, I would like you to do all the tax stuff. I don't wanna look at it. I don't wanna know. I don't even, know. I don't even wanna look. I don't wanna see a number. I don't wanna see a spreadsheet. I don't wanna talk to anybody. I don't wanna do any of it. My expectation is that you could just go run and do that. And the good news is, like a seventh grade boy, I still have a crush on her. And so when she asks me to do stuff and I can clearly win at something, I'm gonna jump. I'm gonna do it. When she tells me how I would love, that would make me feel really loved, I'm like, okay, I can do that. I can run with that. I might ask some questions. I might try and figure it out. But man, isn't it great to have clarity? What would it look like to bring some clarity to your marriage and relationship? Now, we give freely in the definition and we also give abundantly. So the second thing, a generous marriage has an attitude of abundance. A generous marriage has an attitude of abundance. One of my favorite experiences in life is dining at a Mexican restaurant. It's one of my favorite things on the earth. And we all know the reason why. Of course, carne asada, all those things, delightful. They have their place in heaven. It's awesome. But the precursor of a great Mexican restaurant, come on. You walk in, chips and salsa. Oh, Lord. Come on. Some of you might be wine sommeliers. I feel like I'm trying to be a salsa sommelier. I'm trying to learn it. I, I wanna know, I wanna know. Ooh, is that a smokiness? Is that what I, is that a hint of oak? I'm like breathing it out. I got a spit bucket for my salsa. I just know like, oh, I, this is what I want. So if you have great chips and salsa, ooh, have we started this experience well. So when you sit down and they fire those things right away, we're on to something, but. I cannot have chips and salsa alone. They need to be coupled with water. Because as much as I love them, I don't do spice very well. I get all sweaty, I get a little clammy, I don't like it. So have you ever had the moment where they were quick with the chips and salsa but slow on the water? So you're eating, I don't have any self-control, so I'm just starting, I'm eating, and you don't wanna let it catch up. At some point you just keep eating, and you're slow, and you're like kind of waiting, you're trying to flag somebody down for water, you're trying to get something. So the perfect scenario, they bring water, they bring chips and salsa, Oh, and you're really set up for something good. But then what makes this the trinity, what makes this the trinity of Mexican food is when somebody is so attentive in their service. Have you ever had this? Where the chips are like half empty and they already replace it? Where your water gets, a, I, wanna, I wanna be scared and startled by my server. That's my goal. <laughs> I, want, I want my water, I wanna take a sip and have them just over my shoulder in my peripherals filling that thing back up. I'm like, oh my, you have a place in heaven. It's an angel. It's an angel right here on earth. They're just filling my water. They're ready. It's a silly example, but isn't that kind of what we would hope for in our marriage? Isn't it? It's a silly example. But our spouse would be so attentive to what's going on in our life and so quick to serve that they would want to be accessible. They'd want to be available. They'd want to be near. The reason that you and I get so frustrated when our water runs out at a restaurant and we, we're like, come on, come on. It's one, because you need it. And two, because you know it's available. It's readily and easily available. We know it. Just go fill that thing up at the tap, whatever it takes. Get me some water. And the same thing happens for your spouse, where you see their time and attention and affection, and you know it's available. It just oftentimes feels inaccessible. And if you're not careful, we start to guard them like a resource that's finite, we start to guard our affection and attention and emotions as something that is dispensable. So like, I, I can't give you too much unless you're gonna give me some too. I can't, I can't be quick to do this for you because I don't know if you're gonna quick to reciprocate. And so we start to hoard and we don't live in abundance. And here's what I'll warn you. If you're looking for your spouse to fill you up, if you're looking for your spouse to be your source of refreshing and renewal, you might be disappointed. But the good news is, that we serve a God who says, I will refresh you. I will be here to support you. I will be here to care for you and nurture you and provide for you. So if you look to me 
You will be overflowing, ready to serve your spouse at all moments, not just waiting for them to reciprocate so you can be attentive. You can know what's an available resource. You know you can be there for them. When we think about abundance, oftentimes we think of grand gestures. Think of the big things, the big gift, the big vacation, all these things you circle on the calendar, you get so excited about, and those have their place, they are great. But in this study from the University of Virginia, the, the, the lead researcher in the study actually had this interesting thought when it came to the abundance that we're giving. And think about this, this is a secular study, this has nothing to do with faith, but he found so many faith principles on accident. In marriage, we're expected to do our fair share when it comes to housework, childcare, and being faithful. But generosity is going above and beyond the ordinary expectations with what? Small acts of service, making an extra effort to be affectionate. It's about the small things. It's not always about the next big gesture that you can make. It's about the small, tangible, focused things. Listen, this week, maybe you come home from work and your spouse comes home and you have chips and salsa waiting for them. Does two things. One, nobody's mad at chips and salsa. And two, it proves that you're listening in the message and you actually wanna try. I hope we get flooded with emails this week of pictures of chips and salsa and happy spouses. I hope that. I hope that happens. I dare you. I hope we flood the Tostitos industry. They are gonna be dumbfounded by what happened in Redmond, Washington. I hope that happens because it's in the small moments, in the small things. Come on, you know what your spouse's chips and salsa is. You know what's important to them. You know that if you came, they came home and you had a bath already run for them with some candles all lit up, some little incense, some smelly things, and a little book, a little lava cake. It sounds great. <laughs> you know, you know they're gonna feel seen and heard and feel it in abundance. Now, I'm not naive. By this point in the message, <laughs> some of you are thinking, that's adorable. That's like really Cute, like, oh, isn't this great? Be more generous, neat church talk. But if you knew my marriage, if you knew what I was going through, man, if you knew my spouse and I tried to do this above and beyond abundance, generosity thing, they would run right over me. They would take advantage of me. I would be, I already feel used. I already feel exploited. Why would I make it worse? I already do this stuff and they do not reciprocate. They don't mean anything. Come on, come on. What would it look like to try? What would it look like to give effort? What would it look like to just, and maybe you can't be generous with the big things. Maybe you're just generous with a smile this week. Things have gotten really hard and just in a passing glance, instead of the snarl and the stare and the mean and the angry and you shouldn't and the contempt in your eyes, you just showed a little bit of warmth. What if you started there? What if you're generous in the littlest ways and see where God could work in the midst of it? I heard a great story of a Christian divorce attorney and uh, this gal came in wanting to get a divorce from her husband and she was fired up. I mean, she was mad. She said these words. She goes, I want it to hurt. I want him to be in pain. I want to take everything. I want to ruin him. I want it to be, I just want to tear him down to nothing. And the divorce attorney's like, yeah, let's get him. Let's get him. Let's get him. The divorce attorney looks at her and says, yeah, okay, you want to make it really hurt? Man, if we do that, if we just go at him all mean and angry, you know, honestly, he's going to be kind of glad you're gone. But why don't you do this? why don't we drop the papers for six months from now and you take the next six months and you be his dream wife. You be the dream spouse he always wanted. You go above and beyond. You do everything. You do the chips and salsa. You do all of it. You serve him over the top. You're generous with your words. You're kind. You come home. Honey, how are you? How was work? You're attentive. You're affectionate. You're encouraging. You're all the things. And then in six months, we rip the rug out from under him. Oh, he's not gonna know what hit him. He's gonna miss you so bad. That'll hurt more than any money that we can take from him. She says, yeah, now we're talking. <laughs> Get him. So she goes to work. She goes to work. Oh my gosh, sweetheart, you look strong today. Have you been lifting? She knows he hasn't. But <laughs> you've been at the gym, haven't you? Wow, I don't forget. You're so handsome. You're all these things. She's doing all the stuff. Six months goes by. Divorce attorney calls her, says, all right. It's game time, let's get him. She says, you wouldn't believe it. You fell back in love. You wouldn't believe it. We fell back in love, you wouldn't believe it. I had to tear up those papers, you wouldn't believe it. We're closer than we've ever been. We're, we're, we've done more together than we ever have. He's more receptive than I ever thought he would be. I think we're changing and I don't think I want a divorce. <laughs> no, 
seems like a wild story, but what if you started? What if you started today to love abundantly? Let's move to point number three. Point number three uh, leads us to this one. Maybe, yep. It believes the best possible interpretation. (laughs) This is words and actions, people. It believes the best possible interpretation of what our spouse is bringing to us. The information that we're presented with, it believes the best possible interpretation of it. What would that look like for you? to start to believe the best possible interpretation again. And I know it's easy not to. I know it's easy not because we default to offense. We default to thinking they have an agenda, that they're meaning something. We get frustrated over it. Why would you say that to me? Why would you do that to me? You know my seventh grade boyfriend said that to me. Why would you bring that up? Like, you, you did that on purpose. You get frustrated. Come on, what would it look like to just really believe the best possible interpretation when it comes to our spouse? We see this passage, we read it at weddings a lot. It's one of my favorites. I'll read this at weddings even when I perform weddings. It's so powerful, it's so beautiful. Here's what it says. But at the beginning of creation, God made them male and female. And for this reason, man will leave his father and mother and be united to his wife, and the two will become one flesh. Oh, I love it. And so they're no longer two. No, they're not. They're one flesh. Therefore, whatever God has joined together, let no one separate. And then we light a little candle together. We pour some sand into a thing and the sand mixes together and we go, oh, it's one. It was two, but now it's one. You can't even separate that. It's beautiful. And we love it. It's beautiful. And we think this is just like gentle, soft illustrations. Really, this process is more like two Mack trucks going 60 miles an hour at each other. And it's just hot metal and carnage that fuses together and somehow this thing comes together because you got your baggage and I got my baggage and you got your history and you got your, and the way your parents fought and the way my parents fought and the way I watched Home Improvement and the way you watched Brady Bunch and now it all comes together in this hot mess of expectation and we come to each other and we think, how do we make two become one? Because you know this to be true, opposites, they attract, but they don't fulfill. Opposites attract, but they oftentimes frustrate. Opposites, they're really attractive, but sometimes it can be really challenging. I'm gonna take a poll and I want you guys to play along. Can you please, I want you guys to play along with me on this one. I have a few questions for you and I wanna know what group that you fall into in here. Raise your hand if you are a punctual person who's on time to things, come on. Yeah, you raised your hand quick even. Look at you, that was on time, you were with it. All right, opposite, raise hand if you are socially late. Like you are socially like, yeah, 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 yeah. it's okay, like I don't, I know who you are because sometimes you'll come up after a service and you'll be like, hey, I loved this week. You guys started with music. It was so powerful. <laughs> it was amazing. You should do that every week. I'm like, we do, we do. We should do every week. You're just not here for it, but that's fine. That's fine. God still loves you. That's okay. You have a place here. Just here are our service times and just be around, around there. <laughs> How many of you guys, okay, when you're on a road trip, you're on a road trip. Some of you are the, uh, we're gonna get there Fast and efficient. You have an itinerary. You know where you're going and you do it. Come on, where are you? Yeah, 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 yeah. Someone asked for a rest stop and you're like, listen, you check your printed itinerary. You had a chance, okay? Your bladder infection is your fault, okay? You you own this. How many of you are here? Come on, come on. How many here are like enjoy the ride people? Yeah, come on. Let's take the long way. Let's stop for that plaque that no one reads, right? Sweetheart, do you know what happened here in 1947? This is beautiful. There was a tree that fell down once. Isn't that great? <laughs> and everyone, no one cares. They're just fighting, 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 fighting. Okay, last one, last one. How many, who, who in here are the uh, savers? Who are the savers when it comes to money? You, you have your budget. You are ready? Come on, your budget was printed on the backside of that itinerary. You know what I mean? <laughs> you got the Excel document. You got it over here. Where are my spenders? Where are my spenders? Yeah. We're actually gonna take an offering right now. Praise God. <laughs> That's my people. Oh, isn't it fun to see the differences? But when I do it like this, it feels like a sitcom. There's a laugh track. Oh my gosh, look at you. You spend, I save. Ha! (laughs) But how many times have you held an Amazon package in the air in contempt? (laughs) You keep spending. Why are you spending? We need to save. We need to save. You get frustrated. It's funny to see in the room. But then when it plays out in reality, you're like, no, you drive me nuts. You drive me crazy. What are you doing? Why would you think to do that? Why would you make that choice? Why would you do it? 
For each and every one of us, what would it look like to humble ourselves and start to meet our spouse? Maybe not in our own preferences, maybe not in exactly the way that we would do it, but realize that the differences that we bring to the table can unite us into something significant. I'm gonna take you back to the apex of my sports career. It was seventh grade basketball. And um, we didn't have a lot of skill, but we did have tenacity. And so uh, I remember our coach, knowing we didn't have a little skill, was like, hey, you, we're gonna be a hustle team. We're gonna outrun you, we're gonna outpace you. You're gonna go for every rebound, you're gonna hold that thing tight. Every loose ball, I want you on the floor. Our team's diving and fighting. I remember seventh grade, I pulled down this rebound, I'm holding it tight, I'm just elbowing every person around me like I was trained to do. And I'm fighting, and, I'm, and all of a sudden somebody else grabs a ball, and we are fighting and fighting this thing out. And I said, no, I will not quit. This is the one thing I bring to the table is hustle. And I'm fighting this thing off, and I hear from the sideline, same team. <laughs> Lift my head up, fighting my buddy for the ball. Same team. <laughs> can I just, uh, from the sideline of your marriage, can I just shout, same team. You guys have been fighting and fighting and fighting and fighting. You're on the same team. Quit. You're on the same team. You're fighting for the same thing. You both want to see success. You both want to see hope. You both want to have joy. You both want to have peace. You're fighting for the same things. Some of you come talk to us and you're like, man, if you knew my spouse, they just want to fight about everything. That's kind of the person you want to be teammates with who can take on any problem side by side and fight with you. Unfortunately, you start to fight each other. Maybe it's time to get side by side or back to back and start fighting the things that are around you instead of fighting each other. Next thing, come on, I need to move forward. Here we go, point number four, contextualize kindness. Contextualize your kindness. A generous marriage contextualizes kindness. Uh, I don't have a big holiday coming up. <laughs> it's not my birthday, it's not. Uh, it is Father's Day coming up though. So if you wanna give me a Father's Day present, not mad about it. And uh, let's say you did, in this fictional scenario, you brought me this big box and it was long, skinny, I got so excited about it. And I opened it up and you got me the top of the line, best of the best, most expensive, custom made fishing pole on the planet. I wouldn't care. I wouldn't care at all. I, it's great, it's very thoughtful. I would be like, yes, that's all, oh, wow, thank you so much. I don't fish. Some of you have spent so much time getting your spouse a fishing rod when they don't fish. You've spent so much time trying to care for them in a way that they don't care about. That you spend so much time trying to show up and care and be there for them in a way that actually doesn't mean much to them. Here's what the Bible says about this. This is so great. One person gives freely, yet gains even more. Another withholds unduly, but comes to poverty. A generous person will prosper. Catch this. Whoever refreshes others will be refreshed. Whoever chooses to refresh other people will themselves be refreshed. Now, if you had to think of a word to describe a marriage, it might take you a while, but isn't a refreshing marriage something that would be great? Every time you saw your spouse, you just felt refreshed. Every time you were around them and you just both gave generously to each other and you just felt refreshed by that relationship, oh, it sounds amazing. And before I get to my last point, here's all I wanna say. I usually always try to end a message with like hope, excitement, joy, God is with you, it's great. That's true. This one's gonna feel a little bit more negative, but man, if we, don't, if we miss this, I think we miss too much. A generous marriage isn't fair. A generous marriage isn't fair. And some of you, you've made fair the gold standard of your marriage. If I get mine and you get yours, then we'll all be fair. We'll be square and we'll be good. But listen, you don't want a fair marriage, you want a generous one. Think about it in a relationship with God. You don't want a fair God, you want a generous God. You don't want a God who gives you exactly what you deserve because we all know what we deserve. We all know we've fallen short. We want a God who leads with grace, redemption, hope. It's the same thing that we want in our marriages. If you catch nothing else, catch this first. Straight from the word of God, this is it. Each of you should give what you have decided in your heart to give. What would you decide today? Would you decide today that you want a generous marriage? Would you go back to the vows that you made? Said I wanna love you unconditionally? sickness and health, richer or poorer? Would you go back to those? Because you've decided those in your heart. If you go back to those and you give them, look at them, not reluctantly or under compulsion, which is what we get to sometimes, reluctantly or frustratingly or with expectations in return or knowing that's a finite amount. Come on, come on, come on. Better than that, better than that, better than that. For God loves a cheerful giver. The same way God loves a cheerful spouse. The same way you love a cheerful spouse. 
who's excited to give, doesn't feel like they're twisting their arm. You want a spouse who gives generously, not because they're hoping to get something in return and just hoping things get better, but because they love you and they're for you and not against you. And on the heels of Easter, next week, Next week, we're gonna celebrate a God who is for us and not against us, who made it abundantly clear what his stance is for you, not because of anything we did, because of everything in his character. He showed what generous love looks like, freely and abundantly gave his son. So for us, if we're gonna model our lives after something like that, maybe we could find a version of marriage (laughs) better than you even hoped for, better than the vows that you said. Maybe a marriage that refreshes us, that put God's in the middle, shows a sense of generosity. We're gonna take communion in just a few moments, in the middle of a song, but I would love to pray for you first. I'd love to pray for your marriage. So let's bow our head and close our eyes and let's take a moment to pray. Heavenly Father, I pray for every marriage in this room. God, I even pray for the ones that haven't come to pass yet, that are in the future. I pray right now that we would sow the seeds of health for later that you plant in us a heart of generosity. For those of us that are in the middle of it, we realize it's two imperfect people coming together trying to live their best. We acknowledge that. And God, I just pray that you would give us the wisdom, the skill, the tenacity and the bravery to live generously. It doesn't come naturally for any of us, but God, when we do that, not only do we get a glimpse of what your love looks like, but we find the healthiest version of marriage. I pray for every person in this room who's in the middle of a frustrating season, a disappointing season, or a hopeless season when it comes to their relationships. I pray that right now you would begin to breathe life into it in a way that only you can. You'd begin to bring hope to it right now. Heavenly Father, that right now in this moment, the sun would begin to rise on a new day. That they would look at each other and say, we can fight about the past or we can decide our future will be better. We can come into this thing united. We may not be perfectly aligned in everything, but Jesus, right now, we choose to be generous. Let us be known for generous marriages. Heavenly Father, thank you for your grace. It shows us the way. Pray right now in these next moments, you would fill us up so we can give to our spouse abundantly and freely. Pray this in Jesus' name, amen. Thanks for watching. But before you go, please be sure to bookmark this page so you can find us again next week. And are you looking for a way to get engaged and join a team? The online chat engagement team is a role that anyone and everyone can do. And it's simple. Engage with people. Create an environment where people are free to be themselves and more importantly, open to receive the truth of Jesus. And if you're interested in joining this team and becoming part of what God is doing through Timberlake Online, please let me know on your connection card. Links can be found in chat. And I'll see you here next week at online.timberlakechurch.com dot com.